In this lecture, I'm going to continue telling you about line strength. And we're going to see what affects the line strength in terms of um, lines that have more strength versus lines that have less strength. Now, the key thing to remember is that, of course, any line that you see is associated with a particular transition between energy levels in a certain element. Um, so if we see a line at 650 nanometers, that's like the H alpha line, that of course comes from the n equals 2 to 3 transition in hydrogen. If it was a different element, the transition from 2 to 3 would have a different wavelength. If it was a different transition within hydrogen, it would have a different wavelength. Each line goes with a particular element and a particular transition. Now, the strength of that line tells you how often that transition occurs. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what would affect how often a transition occurs? Well, first off, the composition is obviously important. If you don't have any hydrogen in an object, then you're not going to get any lines from hydrogen. If you don't have any oxygen, you're not going to get any oxygen lines and so forth. But the other thing that will affect this is temperature. And that's going to be the big thing that we're going to talk about in this lecture and the next one, is how does line strength relate to temperature? And the reason temperature is relevant is because it determines which energy level the electron's going to start in. If I don't have the electron in the right starting level, then I'm not going to get a particular transition. If I want to get H alpha, I have to be in the n equals 2 state to begin with um, so that it can jump from 2 to 3. If it's in the n equals 1 state, then that's not going to happen. If it's in the n equals 3 state, that's not going to happen. And temperature does determine that. Temperature tells you where the electron is going to begin with. If an atom is hotter, then it's going to have more energy, and that means that the electron is going to be in a higher level. So in the coolest stars, the red ones, the ones that are like 3,000 degrees or something like that, you're going to start with the electron in the n equals 1 state. It will be in the ground state. In a slightly warmer star, like the sun, kind of yellowish-orange, um, then we'll begin in the second state, um, n equals 2, and in a very hot star, it might begin in n equals 3 or even higher. Uh, so the temperature tells you where it's going to start. So if you think about this, in a very cool star, we're not going to get transitions from 2 to 3 because the electron starts in n equals 1. And in a very hot star, we're not going to get transitions from 2 to 3 because the electron is already in n equals 3. It can't transition to 3 from there. So in a cool star or a hot star, we're not going to see a transition from 2 to 3, which is what we're looking for with H alpha. In hydrogen, the way it works out, in fact, is that if you've got transitions from the n equals 1 state to anything higher, the wavelength turns out to be ultraviolet. Remember when we have a big change in energy and changing from 1 to 3 or 1 to 4, something like that, that's a big jump. That involves absorbing a lot of energy. That means it's got to be a very high energy photon that's going to be ultraviolet. N equals 3 states to higher states are going to be infrared transitions because this doesn't involve a big change in energy. I don't need a very energetic photon to get me to go between two levels that are very closely spaced. So transitions from the n equals 3 state will be infrared. However, transitions from the n equals 2 state to 3 or to 4 or whatever, turns out that those are invisible. So uh, things like H alpha that we keep talking about in the activity that we're doing in class, things like H alpha are going to turn out to be visible, those are the ones that come from the n equals 2 state in hydrogen. Now, the early scientists who were studying line strength decided to come up with a classification system based on how strong the lines were. And the lines that they chose to use were 
the ones that are in the visible part of the spectrum. Because this was being done in the late 1800s, early 1900s. The technology at that time wasn't good enough to see things in ultraviolet or infrared. All they had to work with was stuff that was visible. So they used the visible lines, like H alpha and H beta, to classify the stars. And they classified them based on the line strength. And the classification scheme that they used is called spectral types. This is a very important vocabulary word. You need to know about spectral types. Uh, this is a classification scheme based on the strength of the H alpha line. Um, again, they're using H alpha because it is visible. Even though it's the 2 to 3 transition, which doesn't seem like the most obvious transition to use, it's one that um, it's one that they could actually see. So uh, this is an alphabetical system. And when they first developed it, they went all the way, every single letter A through O. Um, that was how they classified it. But over time, they decided it's not really necessary to be that specific. And so they got rid of a lot of the letters. And so the system that we are left with today, from strongest lines to weakest lines, are A, B, F, G, K, M, and O. In type A stars, you have very, very strong visible hydrogen lines. In O stars, you have very, very weak visible hydrogen lines. Again, this is the H alpha line. So I can say that I know that in type A stars, that transition from 2 to 3 is happening frequently. In type O stars, it is happening very infrequently. So the ones that have the strongest lines are having two to three transitions very often. The ones that are later in the alphabet have that transition occurring very rarely. So the earlier in the alphabet you are, the stronger that line is, the more often we see transitions from two to three. The sun is a very typical star. Over and over again, we see the sun is extremely average as stars go. And it's right in the middle. It's a G-type star. So it, you can see the H alpha line in the sun. And in fact, I pointed it out to you in the last unit, although you may not realize that. Um, so we do see it. But it's not terribly strong. It's just sort of medium. So it happens in the sun not extremely often, but not extremely rarely either. And we'll talk more about how this connects with temperature in the next lecture.